Hey guys, hey everybody. It is day 125 of spiritual health care. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome everyone. It is good to be back in, here we are, end of October. Um, I'm sorry we didn't do last week, but last week I was um, at the uh, uh, Renaissance Hotel and doing a, uh, a, a show at the, at the Renaissance Hotel, which was all live streamed. So um, that was my morning yesterday on when, or last, last week. So, uh, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you. Uh, we're back today with a new episode of spiritual healthcare. Um, and today is going to be a lot of fun because we've got some really, really cool questions, some mind bending questions, um, as well as, um, some really, just, some, just some interesting topics, including, um, Annabelle. Anybody see Annabelle? Uh, so we're going to talk about Annabelle. We're going to talk about the Dybbuk box and possessed items, um, as well as the fact that I got a, a really fantastic question in from Dan that I want to grab for today. It was, uh, it's a, it's a fantastic question. I just, I got such a kick out of it and it has to do with, um, computing and consciousness. Uh, so we're going to go through all of it. So good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Uh, I hope you guys are having a good Halloween week because it's, it's coming. It's coming. We're like, we are so close to Halloween. Are you guys like, tell me if you guys are dressing up. What are you guys doing for Halloween? Post it in the, in the threads. Um, I'm going to be at a, a very haunted hotel on Halloween, uh, which is, I, I think is going to be uh, just a blast. Um, I've been uh, working a case recently that has been really mind blowing and it's been so much fun. Um, so that's been really, really good as well, uh, which I'll have more details about as we go along um, in the next month, because right now I've, there's so many questions around this, it's crazy. But today, 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 as I say, I wanna talk about the idea of haunted objects. Haunted objects, what is going on with that? Um, and we're gonna talk about the Annabelle case, uh, which of course was popularized by the movie um, The Conjuring, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll chat about that. So good morning to Marge and Dan and Sally, John and everybody that's logging in, it's so good to see you. Um, yeah, whoever I have not said hello to, hello. Um, yeah, so as I say, we got Halloween coming up. We got to talk about Annabelle um, and a little bit about uh, uh, the Dybbuk box as well, because it all kind of, it all kind of melds together. It's kind, it kind of runs into the same family, I guess, of uh, of weird things happening in a way. Um, people often relate the two together, but we're we're gonna. The phenomenon is actually very separate, so we're going to talk about both. Um, but the first thing, as I say, I wanted to get to was was Dan's question because I thought it was so good and so interesting, and it actually tied in to a theory that has come out very recently uh, in the public in the quantum theory world about consciousness and the soul and what is consciousness and what's going on. So... Um, the a, a while back in some of the prior classes you guys probably remember um me talking about uh the global consciousness project so the rng experiments random number generator experiments where um they basically are monitoring the the global consciousness global awareness with random number generators so when people are really focused into something the random number generators will will spike right? They'll spike when there's an emotional event going on in the world. They used, they, they noticed spikes during 9-11, um, you know, any of the major crisis, uh, that, that have happened, um, since this experiment has been going. So, uh, interestingly, they've been also Brian Williams, who's, he's a friend of mine and a great colleague. Uh, he has uh, been watching the random number generator through uh, the presidential debates. And interestingly enough, they haven't spiked in the same way that they were expecting. And it could just be because people are just tuning it right out. Um, I've been reading a lot on Facebook of people just, they get a quarter of the way through the debate and they're so irritated with it, they just shut it off. So the, the global consciousness... Um, uh, project itself has not been getting the same numbers, which is really intriguing. So Dan's question had to do with computers and consciousness. Out of all the things that he has experienced, uh, he says, uh, I've been in the information technology field for over 30 years and never saw a haunted computer. 
Uh, I understand sometimes it appears that computers seemingly have personalities and minds of their own, and in some cases, especially with AI, might even appear to be conscious, but he's never run into it. So I, I think this is so interesting because, of course, we're, we get into this topic of AI versus intelligence and consciousness and how does this all blend together, right? So this question came at such a good time because in the quantum mechanics world right now, uh, there's a really controversial new theory that suggests that the electromagnetic field around the brain is actually allowing for what we consider consciousness. This is pretty huge. This is, is pretty huge. So it's, it, the, the theory was presented by a fellow by the name of um, John Joe McFadden uh, the uni at the University of Surrey, and he is convinced that the mind is actually electromagnetic that of course mind body dualism the idea that we have the physical body and then we have a presence a consciousness that inhabits and we translate that consciousness um has been a very age-old question in science uh but they are beginning to wonder is this as simple as our brains forming an electromagnetic cloud during our lives and that is where we draw this information from so I thought this was really interesting. So, you know, is, is the reason why that we don't see, you know, haunted computers and things like this having to do with this electromagnetic field that we're tapping into, right? So I, I thought this, as I say, it came from a really neat place. Um, and of course the big question becomes, where does our self-awareness and sentience actually arise from? Of course, people who uh, believe that everything is physically present, <clears throat> that everything that is real is physical, they're called materialists. And dualists, of course, believe that there is a non-physical component to everything that we see, which is what I personally subs subscribe to. Um, and that the, the consciousness is actually separate from the body in, so, in some way. But anyway, I thought this theory was, was really interesting. Um, so basically McFadden is saying that he doesn't believe that the physical structures inside the brain account for how much information actually extends through our minds um, and form basically these, these almost like integrated ideas, right? So that must be happening in his opinion uh, within the added medium of the brain's electromagnetic field. So you know, can, can computers be haunted? What does that even mean? Uh, which is why as I, say, I wanted to get into the idea today of haunted objects like Annabelle, uh, and whatnot, because I think ultimately, I think we're, we're going to be able to at least answer a few different questions. So over the years that I've been in a researcher and whatnot, I haven't come across a lot of haunted of people saying, you know, this object is haunted. Of course, Houses, I guess, can kind of fall into that category. My house is haunted, house being an, an object. Um, but usually when we get an object that has a paranormal phenomenon that seems to be surrounding it, it what I have found is that usually it has to do with a negative entity that has become either territorial over the object itself or is using the object as a way to manipulate the people in the house. So in the case of Annabelle, if you guys saw The Conjuring, Annabelle was in, in real life this Raggedy Ann doll that was bought for uh, a nursing student and she roomed with another nursing student at a at, at sort of a, a, a dorm apartment um, in 1970 and she was given the doll as a gift and it was one of those great big Raggedy Ann dolls. In the film it was a, a sort of a porcelain doll that was really creepy it's really ugly, uh, but in, in real life, it wasn't at all. So um, they began to discover weird things happening. Like they would find the doll in different rooms. They would find it with its arms crossed all of a sudden. They would come home and see its legs folded or it would be kneeling. Um, they, would, they would discover all sorts of bizarre things with it. Um, and the researchers, very controversial researchers, Ed and Lorraine Warren, ended up uh, uh, approaching the case about a year after the doll was purchased. So they'd been dealing with quite a lot, like the, these two had been dealing with quite a lot with this doll. Um, and some of the weirder things it did, it got pretty bizarre. So Annabelle, for example, would, uh, would leave written messages. And this is something that we see sometimes with negative entities. Uh, what they will do is you'll, they'll, they will write out 
uh, messages, even in photographs. So uh, a friend of mine, a fellow investigator, Kerry Gaynor, he worked a case years back, was, I think it was roughly, could have been roughly around the same time period, um, years back where he was actually taking photographs and messages and writing were actually showing up in the Polaroid photographs, direct answers to questions. So with Annabelle, what was happening was that they were actually finding pieces of paper with, um, with all sorts of sayings on it, like help us, um, help Lou, who was Angie's fiance. Um, and they were written on parchment. The weird thing about this is the fact that apart from the messages was the fact there was no parchment in the house. So Angie and, and Donna, they kind of thought, okay, somebody's, somebody's pranking us. Like what is, what is going on? This seems really weird. Um, and, uh, they were even reported at one point noticing that the doll had what looked like drops of blood on its chest. It had some sort of red substance, um, sitting on its chest. So they wanted to know what was going on and they actually brought in a medium because they thought, okay, what is this? What is this? You know, what is Annabelle? What is going on? So what was interesting, which was not a, we're not really a surprise to, I, th I think investigators now looking in on it. And I don't think it was a surprise at the time to, uh, Ed and Lorraine either was that the, the medium and the people who, uh, were trying to investigate Annabelle kept coming up with the image of this little girl who kept saying that she had been killed in a car wreck. She'd been killed in a car wreck or a motorcycle accident. Sorry, it was motorcycle. She'd been killed and she wanted to be able to, you know, move into the house, um, befriend the girls and this type of thing, which right off the bat should send up some serious, serious red flags. You don't get human entities that want to do that. That's just, the human spirit just doesn't want to do that. We pass over. That's not a thing. Um, and when we look at the actions of Annabelle, they don't match up with what you would consider a human spirit either. So for example, the, the, uh, uh Angie's fiance, Lou was getting regularly attacked by this, by this entity. So at one point he had, he had gone over to move, move the doll and he ended up with, with deep welts and scratches across his chest. He'd been choked. He'd been bitten. It was, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. Um, and so when we look at the actions of what this, what this thing was doing versus the story that it was giving, you can immediately see the, the inconsistencies in, in what's going on. This isn't the, the spirit of a little girl who wants to befriend two people. This is something else. Um, and usually what we'll see is in these cases is that a, uh, a figure that's coming in, uh, like Lou, poor Lou, <laughs> here he is just trying to, you know, hang out with his fiance. Um, someone like Lou will end up posing a threat to a negative entity like that. They tend to be very dominance oriented. And it's almost like if you've had a dog for a really long time and then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's like, it's been you and your dog forever. And the, you know, you, you get a partner suddenly and the partner comes in and the dog is, you know, getting very territorial because it's getting angry, uh, that, you know, it's got somebody that's coming into the bed and there's, you know, there's all sorts of issues with that. So you'll get the dog that will attack the, uh, you know, the, the interloper, what the dog sees is the interloper. Uh, and with negative entities, you'll get this as well. It's, it's definitely not a rare phenomenon. It's not a rare thing to see. Um, so we see the same pattern of behavior here with Annabelle and, uh, you know, it, so it got, it got really interesting. So, um, Ed, Ed Warren believed that the doll or the, the entity that was, a, that was associated with it or using it, uh, was responsible for a death as well. So, uh, they ended up keeping the doll. They took it away and put it into what they call the Warren's museum. And the Warren's museum is uh, basically a collection of objects that they feel negative entities have attached themselves to. Right. Uh, and they're, you know, they don't get touched. They don't get moved. They just get put wherever they're, you know, wherever they're set down and that's it. So, um, the a fellow that passed away, basically, apparently he came into the Warren's museum was getting angry and challenging Annabelle, the, the, the this, this entity that called itself Annabelle. Um, and, uh, when he left, he ended up swerving on his motorcycle, crashed and died. Uh, his, his girlfriend survived the accident, but, uh, was in the hospital for like a year. It was, it was ugly. 
Uh, so he, they attributed that immediately to, to this guy's uh, uh, horrible accident. So what ends up going on in, in cases like this, when you, have, when you have something that seems to be attached to an object or something like that, and I would definitely change the word attached to something more along the lines of something that is dominant or protective of whatever it is that it's, it's, it, it's I guess, bearing weight over. The other thing that can tend to happen is that it lulls somebody into a sense of security. And this is kind of what we see with Annabelle. You're less likely to get rid of a little girl named Annabelle than you are something that is being aggressive and attacking and, and awful, right? Uh, it puts that little bit of doubt in the back of your mind that goes, oh my God, what if this is a little girl named Annabelle who died on a motorcycle accident and something awful happened to her and I am you know, throwing her out of my house. What if this is just an upset little girl? And we see this often with this kind of bluff identity that shows up. It's, it's really interesting. So um, that is my take on Annabelle. I think what we see is a negative entity that had, that for whatever reason uh, was, was using Annabelle as a, a manipulative tool uh, in order to wheedle its way into these girls' lives. And I don't know enough about the uh, the two nursing students to know what was going on with them that would set them at the same vibrational level as something like this i don't know um but something was going on something was going on because you again haunted objects are the same it's it's the same idea as as any other haunting that you're going to experience you really do receive the type of activity and energy that you attract to you you just you just do wherever you're resonating emotionally uh vibrationally what the the energy that you're you're really sitting in as a as a human being uh, those emotions that you're sitting in all that unhealed stuff you really will put yourself on the frequency of, of this kind of activity so when you're dealing with, you know, a haunted object or, you know, when people say this place is cursed or something like that, there has to be a part of you that's resonating somewhere in there uh, with, with that negative activity. And that's why you can have an object that gets passed from person to person to person to person and not everybody has this experience, right? This will happen all the time. I mean, some people who will have, you know, a great experience with an object, never have a problem. You pass it to the next person and all of a sudden they've got, they've got major issues. So it, it really depends on what you're attracting. Now, another case uh, that involves sort of the, this, this haunted, this haunted idea that I hear come up all the time is what they call the Dybbuk box. And uh, it was really made popular by the show Ghost Adventures. Cause I think, I think Zach Baggins took it for his museum or something. Um, but the term the 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 term Dybbuk box was actually created by the one of the original owners of this thing. Uh, it was a fellow by the name of Kevin Manis, and he put this thing up on eBay. It was essentially like a wine box, right? This little wine box is about this big. Um, and he posted that he was a writer. He was a creative professional by trade, uh, and he owned a small antique business. So he put this up with this long story about the fact that the Dybbuk box was haunted. Nobody wanted it. You know, anybody that wanted to bid on it could take it. They just, they were done with it. Um, and he was told that the box had originally um, was or belonged to a Holocaust survivor. And that was, uh, it was given to his, I think it was his daughter or something like that. Um, and, uh, basically the the box had been bought in spain after he had escaped the holocaust and whatnot so basically upon hearing that the box was essentially a family heirloom uh manis offered to give it back to the family and said like look i mean you know if you if, if you want it take it um but the granddaughter basically said forget it like take it we we're just we're done with this um, she said that the, uh, grand, the box was basically kept in the sewing room, um, and it was just never opened, uh, because of what they called a Dybbuk was meant to live in the Dybbuk box. So a Dybbuk is basically, basically the, the equivalent of, of what some cultures would be consider a demon or negative entity or something like that. Pick a term. Uh, 
But um, numerous owners now of the box have have had some some interesting things happen. They've had uh, the smell of of cat urine come out of it, jasmine flowers. Um, people have have reported that they've had nightmares about it, um, and it was it was just sort of passed around from person to person and place to place. Um, the last person to auction it on eBay uh, was a, a student, I believe it was at uh, Truman State University in Missouri. And um, he said the box uh, caused his lights to burn out and his hair to fall out and all, all sorts of things that they were attributing it to. Um, the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit at Goldsmith College uh, believed, that he, here was his take on it, he believed that the box's owners were primed by the story to begin to look for problems. And I think this is a huge part of the, of the Dybbuk box and cases that are similar to this, where there's not necessarily a phenomenon going on, there's not what you would consider a haunting going on, but it looks as if there's bad fortune happening, right? So somebody passes away or, you know, you lose all your money or um, there's, there's just sort of bad fortune that's going on. And I think, I think Chris French uh, of the Anomalistic um, Psychology Research Unit, I think he was correct. Um, I think when we get, when, when we buy into a certain story about something, it begins to set our level of expectation, right? So even if we're on the fence about it, even if we don't necessarily maybe believe in it, there's a part of us and a part of our brain that wants to look for patterns. And our brains do this all the time. We, we look for patterns in things uh, to try to make sense of our world. We try to tie things in together. And sometimes that's where crazy conspiracy theories will come from, is that you end up with you know, people who are linking things that actually don't belong in, 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 a, in a conjoined relationship, right? Um, so people were getting strange health problems with this. They were breaking out in hives. Um, coughing, uh, what almost sounded like allergic reactions uh, to something going on with the box. So when you get objects that are releasing smells and things like that, one of the things you have to look for is, is, is the material and whether or not that material could hold on to things. Here we have the Dybbuk box, which is mostly wood. And I think we have to remember that wood in and of itself is porous. It's porous, it's gonna hang on to things. It's gonna hang on to allergens, it's gonna hang on to bacteria, it's gonna hang on to um, uh, smells. So when the wood, for example, this is one thing people mistake for residual energy sometimes, is that when you go into a house uh, and the, there's construction done, suddenly people will say, oh my God, I was smelling cigar smoke or I was sell smelling somebody's perfume. Uh, or flowers or something like that. And sometimes what that is, is that the wood is actually releasing that odor. It, the, the odors get trapped in the wood and people start smelling things at different times based on humidity um, and the expansion of the wood and heat and all sorts of stuff. So I think with the Dybbuk box, I think that's ultimately what we're seeing is that we're, we're seeing people's state of expectation change. We attract what we think about. If we're expecting bad luck or we're looking for bad luck or we believe something is causing us bad luck, we will create it. Um, you know, we really do create what we are. And I, I think, I think the Dybbuk box has a, a, a solid explanation in that. Um, the Annabelle case I think is a little bit different. Um, I, I think there's enough of a, a substance of a case and, uh, and encounters and reports to me that demonstrate the fact that there was, there was something paranormal involved with it. And uh, I, it's, it's really hard to ignore that after, after a little while when you see a very set pattern of behavior um, appear in case after case after case. And you can start to, to identify the real ones from the fake ones after a while. You get to kind of, you get to pick through it. I don't always necessarily agree with, with Ed and Lorraine Warren um, and, and their techniques and their tactics. Um, but I, I do think they had an actual, they, they had a case here that was, that was really intriguing. So it was pretty cool. Um, so that being said, uh, of course we've got Halloween coming up. Uh, people have been asking, I've been getting this question <laughs> a lot. Is there more activity on Halloween? Is there anything to that? Um, and the answer is it can be, it, it, de it really depends. Again, we've got this state of expectation, right? We've got we've got not necessarily a global awareness or global consciousness because not everybody celebrates Halloween, but we've got a lot of focus into this, right? We've got a lot of focus into this holiday 
And I wanted to read you guys something that was kind of cool. And it was about focus and global focus and global consciousness from uh, Ask and It Is Given by Jerry Nestor Hicks. If you guys don't have this book, get it because it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, so they talk a little bit about the idea of global consciousness as well. So I wanted to... I wanted to read a little bit of their interpretation of it because I thought it was the, the explanation was so good. So check this out. As a person on your planet, as every person on your planet is having experiences that are causing their desires to be born, a sort of mass summoning is occurring, which literally equals the evolution of your planet. And so the more you interact, the more your personal preferences are being identified and radiated. And the more of your preferences that are being radiated the more are being answered. As such, a powerful stream of source energy is now stretched out before you from which your individual personal preferences will be received. In other words, because of what so many have lived and are living, and because of the summoning power of so many of their desires, the well-being of your future experience is well in place. And in like manner, your current desires will, in turn, provide an energy stream for future generations to benefit from. If your involvement in your time-space reality inspires you any sin sincere desire, then the universe has the means and supplied, the means to supply the results that you seek, because your ability to reach for more expands within each achievement that came before. The expansion might feel breathtaking to those just coming to understand the power of it, but it might feel absolutely normal to those who have already come to understand and expect well-being to flow constantly into their experience. So I love their I love their interpretation of this. Um, I think I think it's a brilliant it, it's it's a brilliant way to speak on it, uh, and it works both ways. It works both ways. So what we what we expect, what we do not allow to flow, when we have that stress, when we have that anxiety, all of that. Um, it, it becomes, it, you know, it, we, we can cut that flow off as well. Um, Sally is asking, do you believe that someone can put a spell on someone else? Um, I don't think anybody can assert themselves into other people's reality in that way. Um, you know, I think, I think what can often happen is that our, you know, if, if say, for example, somebody is um, uh, complicit in, in, in that interaction in some way, if they've got some negative stuff going on or whatever, they will create that for themselves. Uh, they will create that reality for themselves. So I, th I think we have the, I think we have the cr ability to create in our, in our experience. Um, and I think we draw from the other person. And I think this is key. We draw from the other person, our expectations of them or, or there are expectations of that relationship. Um, so for example, if we move into a, uh, uh, you know, a relationship with, let's say, uh, you know, a, you got a new boyfriend or something like that. You move into that relationship having not healed the stuff about, let's use a general example of men. Um, we will create in our experience that person on some level. We will create that hurt again until we heal it. So I don't think it's necessarily that we can assert a spell on somebody else, but we will attract to us what we expect of those people. So it's, it's, it would, it's less that we are asserting it on them. Um, but we just, we resonate with, with the people and the things that are, are going to be equivalent to whatever we've got going in our vibration. That's why often we'll see people move from one relationship to another, to another, to another. And it seems like it's the same relationship again and again. You see it all the time with people who have been uh, victims of domestic violence, who haven't healed properly or have been victims of um, child abuse that have not healed that stuff. Um, we tend to get into a relationship again that will, because it's comfortable, we expect it, um, even though it's not something we necessarily want, it's something that we've known before and we will attract wherever we're resonating. And I think when it comes to, to spell casting or anything like that, we really do get what we, we put out there and we get that expectation back, uh, with, you know, with, with our interactions with, with individuals, um, 
do I think spells and things like that, if we sit and we, you know, we meditate and will, will we get what we want? Absolutely. It's just another form of, of, you know, asking, you know, allowing and receiving. That's all that is. Um, you know, and if, and putting a ritual behind it sometimes can be really powerful. I mean, here we see, um, you know, you know, if you're, if you're of the Christian faith, you, you might, you know, pray, you might kneel and pray. Um, you know, if in, in with, with Muslims, of course you see them, you know, praying hands and knees, um, and whatnot with Buddhists, of course, you see it in meditation and, and things like that. So it really takes on different forms, not necessarily a spell. Um, but, uh, it's, it's sort of the same process, but I, I don't think necessarily that you can, you can force something into somebody else's experience, which they are not resonating with. Um, they have to be resonating with whatever's going on in order to, in order to have that, you know, make some sort of a difference. Um, so everybody, we have some affirmations to do because we got Halloween coming up and we got to celebrate. I hope you guys are celebrating Halloween this year because, you know, so many, I think so many things are getting, getting shucked off because of course, you know, the election is coming up. Um, and I think the next spiritual health care is it, let's see. So the, the next spiritual health care will be the day after the election. Um, so that should be really, that's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see where we're at for that. Um, so peace and affirmations, everybody, everybody take a breath. I'm a channel of peace and well-being, and my need for peace is abundantly met. I unconditionally accept, love, and appreciate myself and who I am. I recognize and am grateful for the abundance that's constantly flowing into my life which I can choose to allow or not. I feel with every breath a sense of peace and love. I help others by maintaining and tending to my connection with source as much as possible. This well-being is accessible to me, even in a sea of uncertainty. At this moment, all is well. I am able to liberate myself from my past and live with peace and serenity. I can see and appreciate all the beauty and abundance of the life around me. I am able to embrace love while letting go of fear. And I find peace with the soothing silence of my inner being. Everybody take a breath. Hope you guys have an amazing, amazing Halloween weekend. As I say, I will be at a... Uh, relatively haunted hotel in the west coast which i'm greatly looking forward to it's gonna be so much fun um and i hope you guys stay safe and have an amazing day have an amazing day have an amazing rest of your week take lots of halloween photos okay lots of halloween photos because next spiritual health care we're gonna be talking about all of it uh mark says she casts her spell and her vote yeah absolutely and remember you guys your attention makes the vote your attention will make the vote the, you know, putting in a ballot, putting in all of that stuff, that's a part of it. But where you put your attention, where you put your attention is going to make a difference as well. Don't be anti someone, be pro someone else, right? So where you put your attention is key. It is absolutely key. And remember that no matter who wins the election, no matter who wins, your ability to create in your reality and your thriving depends on you and depends on your attention and what you give your focus to. So keep that in mind as we go forward into the week and choose, choose your energy, choose your thoughts, choose your energy carefully. And I will see you guys next week on spiritual healthcare. All the classes are on entityseeker.ca and uh, also entity uh, the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash entity seeker. It's always there. And um, I will see you guys next week. Bye, everybody.